people that say that in First Timothy, First uh, Timothy four, it says, "Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, etc., forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods." which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And he says, for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and, and prayer. Okay, so there are people that would argue that when Peter had his dream in Acts chapter 10, and God put down this sheet with food and said, Peter, rise up and kill and eat, and there was all kinds of different stuff in there that now it's okay for Christians to eat anything. Really, anything goes. And the old laws that God gave to those Jews, well, those are no longer applicable to us because we're under grace. And now everything is okay. So that means that pork, shellfish, you know, muskrat, skunk, everything is theoretically on the menu. Well, let's take a look at this and let's examine this topic. Now, here's my disclaimer. Because I know somebody's going to say, well, there are more important things out there uh, than whether what we should eat. Well, that may be. You know, you can always say that salvation is the most important thing. But what I see in Scripture is God telling us what is good, what is not. So I don't think this is a salvation issue. If you've been eating a ham sandwich, I don't think that you're going to hell necessarily. I, mean, I don't think you are. But I know that God has said what is good and what is not. And we're going to look at the question of whether ham is back on the menu. Okay, now let's go ahead and take a look at our scriptures because that is where we have to make our decision is what does the scripture say? And if scripture doesn't say it, then we have no authority in actually believing that. Okay, so what does our scripture actually tell us? Well, let's see if we can't get over there to take a look at this. Let's see here if uh, everything is going to work out just the way it ought to. Here we go. All right. So 1 Timothy, we're taking a look here. 1 Timothy, and it says, Now the Spirit expressly says, All right, then in latter times some will give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. All right. So doctrines of demons. Some people say, well, you know, forbidding to marry. Okay, I agree. Where does it say in the Bible? that it's wrong to get married. Nowhere. It never says that you should forbid anyone to marry. In fact, getting married is considered a really good thing. Okay, the next question is what about abstaining from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth? Ah, now that's an interesting question. Okay, so where did God say that you should abstain from foods which he gave uh, that can be received with thanksgiving? Well, of course, the answer is nowhere. Nowhere in all of Scripture does God ever say that there are foods that you cannot have and you have to abstain from those foods, foods that are to be, to be uh, received with thanksgiving. But you see, that is also part of the answer because what is food according to God's standard? That's the big question. And to be honest, this is what helped me to understand this question. I want you to know that just about every question that I've ever put forward on the Bible Buzz is something that I have had to deal with as well. I grew up eating ham, bacon, etc. I love the stuff. It was delicious. I got into shrimp when I was probably around maybe 11. You know, my grandfather introduced me to it. And I'm like, what is this stuff? It's delicious. And then a little bit later, um, I discovered something called crab. Oh, my, that was tasty. All right, but then I came across these passages in Scripture, and I said, now, wait a second. God said that these things were wrong. Why are they suddenly considered to be right? And are they to be considered right? Well, we have to keep digging. I can't give you the answer yet, because if I give you the answer right now, you'll just say, ah, what are you talking about, Doug? You don't know what the Bible actually says. And have you considered this particular passage? Well, again, that's where I want to take you, take you and show you what these things actually say.
All right, so what I'm trying to do here is to share my screen with you so that you can look at it for yourself. Because when you look at it for yourself, that is when you become a believer. So let's go back to the Word. Let's take a look at this, and we'll just see what this actually says. All right, so here we are in 1 Timothy, and notice here. It says to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. All right, so nowhere in Scripture does it say that you have to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. Well, then the, this begs the question, what is food that God created to be received with thanksgiving? And that takes us right back to Leviticus chapter 11. Now, God has told us what he considers to be food, that is something you can eat, and things that you can't eat. So guess what? If something there's something you can't eat, that means it's not food, all right? And God is the one who tells us as much. Leviticus chapter 11, speak to the children of Israel. These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth, among the animals with whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, and chewing the cud you may eat, okay? So he says, nevertheless, these you shall not eat those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves, a camel because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, it is unclean to you. The rock, hyrax, the hare, the swine, that's called pig, okay? And he says that these are unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. Incidentally, the word flesh is the Hebrew word basar and it means meat. Okay, you're not supposed to eat it. It's not just about the skin. It's their their actual meat. You're not supposed to eat that. All right, and here this he goes on and he talks about whatever is in the the water. So basically, he doesn't uh, he doesn't call out shrimp by name, but shrimp clearly does not have fins and it does not have scales. So therefore, you cannot eat it. And there's you know there's um, things that just don't have it. So you know crab is out lobster is out and it's too bad i have to say those are kind of tasty but i would rather be interested i'm more interested in actually doing what the lord says than just having something that tastes kind of good and to be honest i've actually lost my taste for all those foods i i'm not craving those whatsoever anymore now again he says by these you should become unclean whatever uh, you should become unclean. Whatever touches the carcass of anything should be kind of unclean until evening. And what it means to be unclean is just to have cooties. It's to be contagious. It's something that is not hygienic. All right. So if you uh, touch any of these animals, you touch their flesh, then you are basically uh, you're not in good hygiene. You uh, have cooties. All right. To use something back from uh, you know fifth grade there. All right. And basically, it means that you're now contagious. You've got something on you that isn't good. Now, look at some of these other things that you should not eat. The mole, the mouse, the large lizard after its kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the sand reptile, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. So he says you're not supposed to eat these. And then whoever touches them when, when they're dead should be unclean until evening. He says uh, any of Anything in which any of them falls when they are dead shall be unclean. Now, this makes sense, doesn't it? Let's say that you're going along and you come across a dead animal, and then you touch this dead animal. What do you think? Do you have germs or don't you have germs? Would you go wash your hands or would you not wash your hands? You see, it really comes down to this very, very simple fact that when you find a dead animal on the side of the road and you go over, you don't touch the thing. But guess what? Your little three-year-old comes over. He says, oh, look, Daddy, the animal's dead. And he stretches out his hand to touch it. What do you take? Don't touch it. Don't touch it because that's disgusting, right? It's dirty. It's yucky. It's got germs. Germs, right? That's what we're talking about here. These things have germs. And the animals that God said don't eat are not healthy for you not only just that they're you know they're not healthy like between let's say a steak and you know of, of beef versus a salad right the salad's probably gonna be better for you but we're not just talking you know kind of that kind of basic uh, health we're talking about animals that were never intended to be eaten in other words they were never on the menu they're not considered food so if the swine is not considered food and the mouse is not considered food and the camel is not considered food, 
right? Now, I have to hear a true confession. I uh, w Years ago, we went to this Mongolian restaurant, and they had every kind of meat you can imagine, right? So they had horse meat. I thought, you know what? I'll just try it. I'm here. Man, I felt so guilty eating that horse. It was crazy, you know? And it, to be honest, it wasn't that good. I thought, you know, I actually prefer steak. I prefer a, a good you know, hamburger or, or something from a cow, you know, because that's actually a very tasty animal. I didn't feel good about eating the horse. I just, you know, I felt like I was eating, you know, Mr. Ed or something like that. And I also, I just didn't really care for the taste. Why do I say this? Because, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but I was actually eating an animal that God said not to eat. In other words, it's not food. He just didn't declare it to be on the menu to be food. So when we go to 1 Timothy, and it says that some will be given over to doctrines of demons and that these doctrines of demons are don't get married. Well, that's true. Or don't eat certain kinds of food. Well, that's true as well. But to, what happens then is people say, well, you know, some people are saying you shouldn't eat pork and that's a doctrine of demons. No, you guys, the doctrine of demons is not to eat that eat things that God considered to be food. And now you have to abstain from those. In other words, you know, God said, hey, cow is on the menu, but no, you cannot have cow. That would be wrong for you to have cow. Chicken, it's on the menu. And no, you cannot have chicken. Well, that would be a doctrine of demon because God never prohibited the eating of chicken. He never prohibited the eating of beef. He never prohibited, prohibited the eating of lamb. You can eat all these different animals, right? You can eat turkey, and he's given us the whole list of what is considered food by God and what is not considered food by God. Now, you say, well, Doug, that was back then. That was kind of old-fashioned. And, you know, besides, Peter had his dream. Well, let's take a look at Peter's dream because I think we're going to discover a few more things that will help us to see with a little bit more clarity that Peter's dream is not telling us that these uh, other these other uh, animals are now on the menu. In fact, we really have to understand what was happening in Peter's day. You see, Peter basically fell victim to the oral tradition. The oral tradition said that all Gentiles, that is all non-Jews, are dirty, and you cannot eat. You cannot eat with them. You have to separate yourself from them, and you cannot hang out with them at all. So we go to Peter's dream, and you guys probably know this story. Uh, Cornelius, well, Peter has a dream. I should start with that. So here we are in Acts chapter 10, verse 12, and he says that in this, this sheet that came down were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild bees, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came and to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. All right, now this happens three times. It's taken up into heaven. And then it says, Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision, which he had seen, meant, Behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. So there's Peter. He's thinking about this scenario. He's like, huh, I just had this pretty weird dream. And, you know, in my dream, this sheet was let down with all these different kind of animals. This voice says, kill and eat. And I'm like, no way. I'm not going to do that, Lord. And he says, what God has called common, you must not call uncommon. What God has cleansed, you shall not call uncommon. So Peter's thinking about this thing. Remember, this is Peter's dream. He doesn't know what to make of it. And then immediately it says that there's a knock at the door. Now, that's another clue, isn't it? Because who's at the door? Is it Jews? No. It is people who are Gentiles. Now, the thing is, you're never going to find a law in the Bible against Jews hanging out with non-Jews. There's no such law in the Bible. It says that, you know, to some extent they weren't to intermarry, but that's a different matter. It says that, um, that they're not to intermarry, but as far as, you know, you hanging out with these people or having them over for dinner or saying hello to your neighbor, it doesn't say you can't do that. All right. So that is an important part of our little mystery here is to understand just what is happening. And the good news is that Peter himself gives us the interpretation of this dream. 
So once we understand that Peter gives the interpretation, remember, it's Peter's dream. So who's better qualified to interpret the dream than Peter? Remember, at this point, Peter was kind of stupefied. He wasn't sure what to make of it. But then Peter goes. He um, he goes to Cornelius's house. And then Peter stands up and he says, he says, um, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Ooh, there's the answer to our mystery. Now, first of all, where does it say in Scripture that it's unlawful for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation? Answer, nowhere. It doesn't say that anywhere. So nowhere in the Bible does it say that it's unlawful for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. So where is he getting that? From the oral tradition. Right from the oral tradition. Basically, the Jews at that time were had this idea that they were not supposed to uh, basically even talk to the Gentiles. And so they called them dirty dogs. They called them uh, good for nothing. In fact, they to some of their theology suggested that the Gentiles were created for nothing more than to fuel uh, the fires of hell. And so there was a, a lot of... of um, racism that was going on if we were to kind of bring that up today we'd say you know we call that person uh you know a dirty gypsy or a stinking mexican or a lousy black all right you know whatever term you want to you know find or, or white trash okay it doesn't really matter but you can you can think of any group you can you can talk about the irish you can talk about the english you can talk about the french and you can have some kind of a pejorative term from somebody who's different from you and say, I don't hang out with those people because they're dirty, because they're disgusting, because they never take a bath, because they're they're cheats, because they're just a bunch of thieves, right? And you never want to hang out with those people. That was the same thing that Peter was experiencing. And what was happening is that Peter would, would go because now he's gotten this dream. Later on, you know, Paul's going to call him on the carpet and say, well, wait a second, uh, Peter, you're hanging out with these Gentiles when there are no Jews around, but then when the Jews come around, you suddenly act like you can't talk to these people because he was falling back into that same trap. So what Peter tells us then in verse 28, he gives us the interpretation of the dream. The interpretation of the dream is not that Peg is back on the menu, but that he's not to call any man common or unclean. And once you see that, then it, it makes sense that Peter is not getting this dream which is completely foreign to what God had said previously. Think about it. Neither Peter nor Paul or even Jesus himself had the authority to change anything in God's word. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? Jesus himself says in Matthew 5.19, if anyone breaks the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so, he'll be considered least in the kingdom of heaven, right? So Jesus never said, hey, you know, after my death and resurrection, you guys can go ahead and change some things. He doesn't say that, not at all. He doesn't say that at all. So Jesus confirms and authenticates everything that's in the Hebrew scriptures. Paul himself says in Acts 24, 14, that he believes everything that is written in the in the law or the, the Torah and the prophets, right? So he doesn't tell us to go ahead and break it. Now, does Peter have any authority to break what God said? Of course not. Of course not. In fact, had Peter come along and said, you know, I had this dream, and God showed me that pig is, pig is now on the menu, and, and so are all these other clean, unclean things. We can eat camel now. We can eat uh, rock hyrax. We can eat pretty much anything we want. Anything that's moving, we can eat it. People just said, no, wait a second, Peter. You had what kind of dream? Yeah, I had this dream, you know, and, and the voice said to, to eat. And uh, so now we can do that. Well, if you were a good Berean back in those days, what would you have done? You would have got, you know, cracked open your scriptures, which was the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And you would have said, tell me about that, that dream there again you had there, Peter, because I want to test that against the word. And then Peter would have told you, yep, now now God says we can do this. 
And you would have said, uh, are you sure about that? Because that's not what I read in the scripture. You would have gone back to a place like Deuteronomy 13. And here, Deuteronomy 13 talks about people who have dreams. It says, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams. So that's Peter, right? Peter's a dreamer of dreams. And he gives you a sign or a wonder. And the sign of the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey him. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But the, that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God. Okay, so if Peter had really had this dream that was contrary in any way to what God had said, then he would have been guilty of death. So the idea that Peter can have a dream, and suddenly everyone's like, oh, wow, Peter had this dream, and now we can eat pork. Now we can eat camel. Now we can eat anything that has four feet and is moving, or anything for, you know, doesn't matter. Birds of carrion, you name it. Uh, rat, you know, mouse, uh, any kind of vermin out there. Do you really want to eat that stuff? I mean, this stuff is gross, right? Is that really on the menu? Is rat on the menu? Is dog on the menu? Is your cat on the menu? I mean, seriously, guys, think this through. This stuff is not on the menu because it never was on the menu. So when Paul says that the doctrine of demons will be telling people to abstain from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving. He's not talking about eating camel and mouse and pig and, and shrimp because those things were never created as food to be received with thanksgiving. Does that make sense? They were never created as food to be received with thanksgiving. Now, I could go into all kinds of other reasons why you shouldn't eat pig, because this thing stuff has worms in it. It's been proven. You go check out, go to YouTube. There are videos that you can watch. They're very legit, and you can watch woman has worm on her brain because of a pig. Right? She ate pork, and she got worms on her brain. You say, well, that's because she didn't cook it very well. No, that's because there are worms in the pig. Okay? You know, so sometimes you'll get lucky, and you won't get worms. Because you'll cook it right. But more often than not, you're going to get something in you. And it's been proven that people have all kinds of parasites and worms in them. It's disgusting. They do surgeries to pull this stuff out of people. People have worms coming out of their skin, in their face, let alone in their brain. Right? Uh, you know, we just happen to have good doctors who can pull these things out of your brain without killing you. That's nice. But God said, don't eat this stuff, because guess what? You know what a pig is for? A pig is for eating all the trash. A pig is a, is a biological garbage disposal. That's what it is. That's what shrimp do, right? After a submarine goes by and they, they drop all the crap onto the bottom floor, guess what? guess what rushes out? All the little shrimp to eat all that stuff, because that's what shrimp do. That's what they were created for, and they're very good at what they do, and God was was correct in creating them in order to clean up the garbage on planet earth but you shouldn't eat the garbage disposal let the garbage disposal be a garbage disposal but then don't go and eat the thing that doesn't make any sense that's just stupid now lest you think that this is all old testament kind of stuff because people think that and they say well you know that was for way back then and you know we're in a different time doug you know, I want to take you to I want to take you to Isaiah chapter 66. This is talking about the second coming. Now again, you can do what you want. I'm not going to tell you, you know, what you have to do. I'm telling you what the Bible says and I want to be here to encourage you, but it's going to be ultimately up to you. But I want you to see in Isaiah 66:15 16 and 17, that this is talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. It says, For behold, the Lord cometh fire, and with his chariots to whirl like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. This is talking about the second coming, you guys. For by fire, by his sword, the Lord will judge all flesh, and the slain of the Lord will be many. That is the second coming. Parallel passage, First Thessalon uh, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 
And it says that when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the same thing. That's when he comes back. This is it. Now notice what happens in verse 17. It says those who sanctify, set themselves apart, and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together. So it sounds to me like even at the return of Jesus, he's still not too happy with those people who are eating swine's flesh. Now, again, I don't know all the implications. I don't know if this means that every last Christian who eats pig is going to get killed. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is look at the verse. Check it out. When Jesus comes back, some people who are eating swine's flesh and this abomination and this mouse, which are all abominations, he's not going to be too happy with, and they're going to be consumed together. So all I'm saying is, look, guys, what we need to do is be wise. We need to read our Bibles, like from you know the front to the back, and not throw out that stuff in the front because say, well, that was just for the Jews. That's wrong thinking. Because if we have been grafted in to the nation of Israel, then the things that God gave also apply to us. That's why it says in Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the days are coming when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the in the wilderness when I took them out of Egypt, though I was a husband to them, but I will make a new covenant. I'll write my Torah, that's the word in Hebrew, Torah, my laws, my instructions, on their hearts. So, what do we want to do? We want to keep God's instructions not to be saved. People say, well, this isn't a salvation issue. I'm not saying this is a salvation issue. I'm saying this is a common sense issue. This is how do you have a good life issue? How do you stay healthy kind of issue? That's what this issue is all about. Not whether you get into heaven or don't get into heaven. I'm not arguing for that. And people say, well, this doesn't matter. Salvation is more, what, more that matters. Well, look, this is all part of the part of the package. And God does want us to have a good life, an abundant life. And part of it is what we put in our bodies. So don't put in your body what God has never declared to be food. Now, the things that God has declared to be food, well, those things you should give thanks and, and just pray. And you know what? You can't sit there and pray over your pork chops and say, oh, God, bless this to my body. It doesn't work that way, you guys. God's not going to miraculously change that. And yet that's what people want to do with First Peter chap or First Timothy chapter 4, as if somehow this, this incantation over your food is going to magically change it. Well, it's not. Because it says, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. No, just praying over your food and saying, thank you, God, for this pork, it doesn't make it so that now it's going to be okay for you. Because go back to verse 3. It says, abstaining from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. God did not create pork or shrimp or camel or rock hyrax or the mouse or the rat or dog to be uh, he did not create them as food to be received with thanksgiving. That's the bottom line. They were not created as food. So check it out. Go back to the passages that I showed you. This is it for this Bible Buzz. God bless you. Keep reading your word. Till next time. God bless.